Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Let's talk about intimate partner violence, part four, overdose prevention and intimate partner violence, unique risks, needs, and strategies with our presenter, Gabriela Zapata Alma. This webinar is co-sponsored by the Great Lakes MHTTC and SAMHSA. The Great Lakes ATTC, MHTTC, and PTTC are funded by SAMHSA under the following cooperative agreements. The opinions expressed in this webinar are the views of the speaker and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services and SAMHSA. The MHTTC network believes that, that words matter and uses affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all activities. For more upcoming events and information, please follow the Great Lakes MHTTC on social media or visit our website. A few housekeeping items. If you are having any technical issues, please message me, Jen Winslow, or Rebecca Buller in the chat section at the bottom of your screen, and we will be happy to assist you. We will have a, a period of question and answer uh, for the speaker toward the end. So please put any questions for Gabriella in that Q&A section and we will do our best to get them answered. Um, if captions or the live transcript would be helpful, please use your Zoom toolbar near the bottom of your screen to enable by going into the more section, you select captions and show captions. At the end of this session, you will be automatically redirected to a very brief survey. Certificates of attendance will be sent out via email to all who attended the full session. This can take up to two weeks. Please keep an eye on your junk or spam folders before emailing us um, as often that they can land there. The recording and presentation materials will be available within the next week on the Great Lakes MHTTC website. And now I will welcome our presenter, Gabriela Zapata Alma, who is the Associate Director of the National Center on Domestic Violence, Trauma and Mental Health, as well as a lecturer at the University of Chicago, where they direct the Alcohol and Other Drug Counselor Training Program. Gabriella brings over 15 years of experience supporting people impacted by structural and interpersonal violence and their traumatic effects through innovative and evidence-based clinical housing, resource advocacy, peer-led, and HIV integrated care programs. Currently, Gabriella authors best practices, leads national capacity building efforts, and provides trauma-informed policy consultation to advance health equity and social justice. Thank you everyone for being here and I'll turn it over to you, Gabriella. Thanks so much. Thanks for this warm welcome. It was so great to be with y'all last week and I'm so glad that folks are joining today. Hopefully by now we all have some, some foundational knowledge around the current overdose epidemic. And so today we'll be reviewing some of that foundational knowledge, but um, more importantly, then applying what we know to understand some of the unique risks and needs that survivors of intimate partner violence experience. So by now you may already have uh, come to know a little bit about our center, so I'll keep this brief. We are a national resource center dedicated to the intersection of domestic violence, trauma, mental health, and substance use. And we offer an array of resources and services. And thank you for the invitation to be a part of this uh, series and, and collaborate. We're so grateful to our colleagues over at the Great Lakes MHTTC and grateful to SAMHSA for supporting this programming. So our hope for today is that by attending this session, folks will be able to assess individual risk and protective factors for accidental fatal opioid overdose, be able to identify three evidence-based prevention methods for fatal overdose and safer substance use, and then include awareness of intimate partner violence in overdose prevention planning. So first, understanding overdose. 
So an overdose occurs when a relatively large dose overwhelms a person's body. And then that results in some severe health consequences and which can include death if it's not treated. So in the case of opioids specifically, an overdose causes people to stop breathing. And so without help, people will die from a lack of oxygen. So I mentioned that now so that later on when we talk about the importance of rescue breaths, things like that, that there's some context for it. Also, so that when you're recognizing overdose, you know that you're looking for those signs of a lack of oxygen. And so we'll go into more detail on that. But going back to the part around the relatively large dose, what that means is that that's relative to where the person's tolerance is in that moment. And so one of the reasons why, one of, one of the many reasons that we'll be going over why um, there's a greater risk of overdose related specifically to opioids is because tolerance for opioids can shift dramatically, even within the same day. Now that's only one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is the quality of the substance that the person is using, how strong it is, what it has in it, but we'll be getting more into more detail there. So at this point for, for a very long time, overdose has been the leading cause of accidental death in the US. And it is the leading cause of death for people under age 50, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And so here we see that there have been different waves in overdose, opioid overdose related deaths. Um, so what we see here really is that it is synthetic opioids that are driving this, um, these tragic losses, loss of life. And so this is, this is opioids such as fentanyl um, that has become present in the drug supply. The drug supply has become poisoned. And so as such is resulting in increased drug poisoning deaths. I wanna take a moment here and just recognize how many lives, how many loved ones we have lost to the overdose epidemic. I know that we have all been touched in one way or another by this epidemic. And so extending, um, just extending love to everyone and care and support as we work together to really um, address this overdose epidemic. So fentanyl is driving the, the vast majority of death. And there was a moment there a couple years ago before the pandemic, you see this dip, right? There was a moment there where we were starting to curb the overdose fatalities that we were starting to see them go down, still not go down as quickly as we need them to, as we need to see them, but they were starting to go down. And then with the pandemic, we have seen really record breaking increases, really tragic increases. And these increases are not felt uh, equally across communities. And so while we're experiencing the, um, the greatest jump in overdose deaths, as much as a jump of 33% increase in a single year, right? Um, we also see that African-American folks are being disproportionately impacted. We also see that indigenous people are being disproportionately impacted um, as much as a 12 times higher risk for overdose related to methamphetamine. And so these, these risks and these harms are not equally distributed. And just as we saw that the COVID pandemic also disproportionately impacted people of color, people impacted by poverty, people impacted by all kinds of uh, health conditions, which we know many times are tied to and ex exacerbated by things like poverty and other forms of structural violence. 
we see that also happening with the overdose epidemic. And so when it comes to preventing overdose, something that we want to keep in mind here is that this is a key aspect of racial equity, as well as um, just health equity in general. Some more things to be aware of when it comes to overdose, that over 80% of overdose deaths do involve an opioid, that almost 85% of overdose deaths involved uh, substances that were um, not from a safe supply. So substances that are um, from a kind of a street-based source. And so their contents are often um, unconfirmed. And so very often this includes fentanyls, heroin, cocaine, or methamphetamine. And something to, to really hone in on here is that in looking at these accidental deaths, that three in five of these people, there were potential opportunities to link people to care or to implement life-saving actions. And so, you know, seeing death impact our communities this way is always tragic. Whether, whether or not it's preventable. But the fact that the majority of these losses are preventable um, really needs to be a rallying call, really needs to be um, startling for us and to startle us into taking a lot of action. In an overdose epidemic, it is all hands on deck. Um, we are all impacted and we must all be involved in preventing unnecessary losses. Something else to keep in mind here is that overdose and suicide are leading causes of maternal mortality and are preventable. And this comes from uh, ACOG, the American College of Obstetrics um, and Gynecology. And so really important here to be aware of how people who are pregnant or in the post-pregnancy phase are also at increased risk for overdose, how this is a, a leading cause of violent death amongst people who are uh, in the post-pregnancy phase, that's typically the first year uh, post-birthing. And that when we are looking at overdose prevention, we need to ensure that there are specialized access points for people who are pregnant and people who are parenting. That there can be a lot of unique barriers that people face during these points in their lives. Something else to keep in mind here with the intersection of intimate partner violence is that when people are pregnant, um, if they're experiencing any power and control from a partner or ex-partner, then Pregnancy becomes one of those times where that power and control and abuse increases, where the increase for being killed by an intimate partner, um, that where that risk really increases. When I was a director of treatment programs, there were many, many times that we didn't even realize that somebody was experiencing abuse from an intimate partner until they became pregnant. And it was at that point that the abuse became so, um, so heightened and, and that it could, it could no longer stay hidden. And so here, really understanding the intersection of pregnancy and substance use and intimate partner violence and ensuring that there are safe ways to access overdose prevention materials and counseling. And when I say counseling, I don't mean that it needs to be done by someone who is um, a licensed clinician by any means. What I mean is really that support. So looking at evidence-supported opioid overdose prevention. So here, there are three main uh, interventions that we know um, reduce, at a community level, reduce overdose fatalities. 
First is medication-assisted recovery, sometimes also called medication-assisted treatment. This includes FDA-approved medications such as methadone, buprenorphine, sometimes also known by the brand name Suboxone when it is uh, buprenorphine combined with naloxone. And so medication-assisted recovery is absolutely life-saving. Um, and not only is life-saving, but really helps people to um, be healthy, to have a high quality of life, um, to avoid so many of the unnecessary adverse effects of substance use. So medication-assisted recovery is absolutely an important resource for folks who, um, who meet criteria for an opioid use disorder or who may be pregnant and using opioids in a way that is not prescribed. Now, something to keep in mind when it comes to intimate partner violence is that it can be very difficult to access medication-assisted recovery because of the ways that substance use coercion specifically targets a survivor's access to treatment and recovery resources. And so some of the examples here are that survivors may experience stalking or victimization at their MAR appointments. Um, usually medication-assisted recovery requires a pretty set um, schedule. And so any time that a survivor is uh, held to a set schedule and they are like where they're supposed to be at a given time, that increases their risk for stalking and being found and victimized. And so absolutely, I can tell you as a formal former MAR provider, that there were absolutely times where survivors accessing our program um, would, would be stalked at our center, um, would be you know, on their way into our building and see uh, a past abusive partner you know, stalking them. And so it's incredibly important for us to be aware of this. And some things that we can do if we are either an MAR provider or if we are a support and we're helping someone's safety plan around accessing MAR, some things that help are really, um, you know, talking with folks around MAR options. For example, for a survivor, it may be very helpful to access methadone and have that um, kind of a safe place to be, right, throughout the week. For another survivor, that may just make it impossible to go because it becomes a place where they're stalked or easily found. And so for another survivor, something like Suboxone, which is a prescription that they can fill and then um, keep that prescription with them, may be a lot more accessible and a lot safer for them. There's no one size fits all when it comes to supporting survivors of intimate partner violence because survivors are the ones who know what is safe and accessible for them. And that can shift. So another piece here is that if a survivor shares with us, I can no longer come to this site, then helping them to access another, another center, um, helping them to have that smooth linkage and active service connection either to another site in our same or in the same um, kind of constellation of the organization or with another provider if that's what's needed. Safety planning around those appointments may also include things like flexible appointment times, which right now, most medication-assisted recovery centers are not set up for that flexibility. Right now, if people miss an appointment time, many times that means that they miss being able to access their medication. Again, remembering that this medication is life-saving, how incredibly dangerous that is for people. And so needing to have flexible flexibility in scheduling, needing to be able to potentially stagger appointments, maybe on some days um, the person's coming in the morning and then in other times they're coming in the evening, right? Being able to stagger those so that it becomes unpredictable, then it's, it's harder to stalk someone. Um, things like, of course, addressing any resource needs, knowing that many times survivors don't have access to the resources that they need to access these um, to access MAR because of the abuse, or the abuse has specifically blocked access to things like transportation or insurance benefits 
or childcare in an effort to sabotage their ability to access treatment. And so that addressing resource needs is really important here. And then something that we have come to learn throughout the pandemic is some of the possibilities around tele-based services. Now that said, you know, there are some safety considerations even with tele-based services. And so things like ensuring that survivors have access to privacy for their tele-based services, um, that we are starting, you know, be, the flexibility of being able to have a phone call versus a video call can be important. The survivor being able to choose what is more accessible and safe for them. Um, and then when we start those tele-based services, asking survivors, is this a private conversation? Are you able to speak right now? Asking those yes or no questions so that if there is someone in the room with them, they're able to simply say yes or no. Now, sometimes that even isn't safe enough because sometimes someone may still be listening in, um, may force a survivor to have a call on speakerphone, for example. And so that's where also having something like a safety code or a safety phrase can be really helpful. So for example, when uh, one of our team members was working with a survivor who was, um, who was living with not only an abusive partner, but then roommates who were also abusive towards the survivor, that um, the survivor would say, if it was not a safe time for that person to talk, then the survivor would um, pretend that the call was coming from the pharmacy because the intimate partner, the, the unsafe partner, and the roommates knew that the survivor took some medications. Um, and so the survivor felt safe saying, okay, thanks for calling me about my medications. I'll try to pick them up when I can. And then that would be kind of the, the indication that it wasn't safe for her to talk at that time. And we knew that she was gonna hang up and that she would call us again when it was safe. So some, some of the different ideas to um, build in safety to tele-based services. Now, another form of service that can really help enhance safety for survivors is the growing presence of mobile services services that go beyond the brick and mortar, beyond the four walls of, uh, of a methadone clinic or an opioid treatment center and really go out into the community. Now, there are ways to do this that of course can be um, less safe or more safe for survivors. And again, remembering that just because it may be safer for one survivor doesn't mean it's not safe for all survivors. And so understanding that these are options and that the more options we have, then the more likely it is that we'll be able to find safer options for survivors. And with safety planning, remembering that we are always the, the collaborator um, who is just helping to brainstorm and develop and think about safety and offer options and resources, but that really the person, the only person who can tell us what is the safe strategy and what will be safest? And when no option is truly safe, what is the risk that is tolerable and what is the risk that is intolerable? The only person who can name that is the person whose life it is, the survivor. Now with naloxone distribution, here what we're talking about is really that um, community level, getting naloxone into the community, into people's hands, understanding that really the people who are present when there is an overdose event is often community members, is often many times um, friends, family members, um, other people who use substances, just, you know, neighbors, right? It's community members. So really understanding that everyone in the community needs to have access to naloxone and be prepared to use naloxone. We're all first responders in this overdose epidemic. So with naloxone distribution, if you're not already distributing naloxone, it's a great, great step that you can take in your practice, in your organization, because if a survivor is already accessing a service with you, then even better if they can get access to naloxone directly with you as well. 
So naloxone, also known by the brand name Narcan, is the opioid overdose antidote. It, rever it can um, reverse an overdose related to opioids. Now, something to keep in mind here with uh, the unique experiences of survivors is that while naloxone is absolutely life-saving, is as non-toxic as water, is safe for children and people who are pregnant if they're you know, experiencing drug poisoning. Um, so it's absolutely a safe substance in those ways. Now, when it comes to intimate partner violence, there are ways that naloxone has been used to harm survivors. And so that doesn't mean that um, you know, we should keep naloxone from survivors. No, 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 no. What that means is that there may be a need for safety planning around naloxone, both accessing the naloxone and then storing naloxone in ways that are safe. And so what this means, so for example, if a survivor has been forced into withdrawal using naloxone in order to keep them from attending um, a court date, let's say, a court date around child custody, right? Um, or have forced them into withdrawal as a way to threaten and harm them, or have forced them into withdrawal so that they miss a, um, a probation appointment, right? There's so many different reasons why um, withdrawal is used as a tactic of abuse and, and power and control. So if this is something that is part of the substance use coercion that, is, that a survivor is experiencing from an intimate partner or ex-partner, then that's a really important place to offer some safety planning. So some things that we might be considering, thinking about is, um, you know, where would they store their naloxone safely so that we can minimize the risk of it being used to harm them, but also people have access to it in case of an overdose in order to save a life. Um, this also goes into conversations around how, who are safe supports that may be around when a survivor is using substances? Who can they trust? And then again, you know, this is where that um, risk balance comes into play and that a survivor is the only one who can really um, determine that, that risk balance for their own life. That if the risk of having the naloxone um, used to threaten them with withdrawal is, is tolerable um, versus the risk of experiencing a fatal overdose. So this is where our role is not, to, is not to tell people which risk is more tolerable, is not to tell people what they should or shouldn't do. It's really to ally with survivors so that they can have the support and the safe, the safe space to be able to um, balance these complex risks and situations that they face. And then overdose prevention centers. Overdose prevention centers are um, a place where a person who has already obtained their substance can go to be able to use substances um, and then where they're being supported and monitored by people who are ready to offer uh, support, referrals to resources, and are also ready to detect and reverse a potential overdose if they do experience an overdose. Now, overdose prevention centers have existed in many countries for decades um, and have been found to, to not only decrease uh, overdose fatalities, which is no small thing, remembering how many people were losing to overdose, but also have been found to um, actually help people engage in a lot of different resources, including engage in treatment. So people are more likely to engage in recovery when they have access to overdose prevention centers. But regardless of people engaging in recovery, still people always have a right to stay alive and stay as safe as possible, regardless of whether they're ready or interested in recovery at this time. So um, these have existed worldwide for decades and found to be very effective. And we just recently, just this past year, have had the first ones available here in the US. 
Now, some things that are um, to keep in mind around intimate partner violence here is that um, if overdose prevention centers are also, you know, they're open to the community. They're not necessarily, they're not meant to screen people out or turn people away. But what that means is that a survivor, of course, may be stopped there or may come across um, abusive partners or ex-partners there. So it may not be a safe and accessible place for survivors. So what some overdose prevention centers have done um, is they have offered some women only hours or women only days. And that's something that uh, they have found to be very needed and very effective, but isn't enough because obviously this is a need that isn't just for a couple hours a day or a certain day of the week, right? And so in order to respond to the need, in other countries, there have been some domestic violence organizations that have opened their own overdose prevention center because of the unique needs of people who experience intimate partner violence. So there's so much we can do here to help. So what are some of the key components of how we can help? We can help by building trustworthy connections that foster open, person-centered conversations around alcohol and other substance use. We can learn about the risk factors for overdose, learn what overdose looks like and what to do if someone may be overdosing, share this information far and wide, support folks with safety planning around their substance use and help survivors to access naloxone, help everyone to access naloxone. So um, when I was in direct practice and was providing treatment, um, we wouldn't just give one naloxone kit to people, we would give them five naloxone kits. Because the thing is that there are so many folks who are at risk for overdose and aren't in, in touch with someone like a treatment provider. But if we can get it to somebody who they may use with, then we can help get that naloxone into the community. And what we heard time and time again was people coming back and saying, you know, uh, I was using with this group of people and we were using the same, you know, we had all gotten the same substance and, you know, half of the people who were there started overdosing and and we were so worried we wouldn't have enough naloxone, but because we got enough naloxone from here, we were able to save everyone's life. And people coming back and saying, you know, I'm still sober, but I was at a friend's house and somebody started overdosing and nobody knew what to do. And I had my naloxone kit and I was able to save their life, right? Or people in our treatment program who just leaving one of our groups walked past a bus stop and recognized that two people were overdosing and saved their life. So we want to really saturate the community with naloxone and with people who know how to recognize and respond to overdose. So I'd love to hear from y'all. What kinds of overdose prevention support do you offer or does your program offer if you're working in a program? love to hear what folks are already doing and this way folks can also start to share some ideas and get ideas from one another. So going into overdose risk factors. So some risk factors have a lot to do with our community and our context. So for example, people experiencing housing instability, overdose has been found to be a leading cause of death. And something to keep in mind here around intimate partner violence is that intimate partner violence is a leading cause of homelessness for, uh, among women. And this is especially true among women who have children in their care. And so, not, so in this way, um, not only is it an overdose risk, but it's a risk that also is disproportionately impacting women in, who are um, survivors. People in treatment for opioid use disorder. So this is um, specifically where people aren't uh, connected to medication-assisted recovery. 
So people who only have access to detox without medication-assisted recovery, it was found that um, that was actually a much higher risk for overdose than if they would have never detoxed at all. And of course, that's because with detox, people then have no, to their tolerance is reduced, but there's nothing being done to help with their craving or with their withdrawal. And so in that way, it's actually very, very dangerous and unethical to detox a person without um, helping them to access medication-assisted recovery. Now, that's not to say that we would ever overpower someone's autonomy. If someone says, I want to detox and they, and they don't want MAR and they are making an informed decision, right? They have, um, information has been shared with them around the potential risks and benefits around their decisions and they're making that informed decision, that's different. But if we are, you know, if there's a program that is just detoxing folks, not explaining the risks, and not connecting folks to MAR, then that is um, really, really dangerous and unethical. And also remembering that, uh, you know, studies have found that women who access opioid use disorder treatment um, have anywhere from 47% to 90% lifetime experiences of intimate partner violence. And then looking at the past year, anywhere from a third to two thirds of women in treatment. People living with HIV have been found also to be at increased risk of overdose. Some of this may be due to the way that HIV impacts our physical systems. Another part of this may have to do with medications used to address HIV and how they may uh, potentiate opioids or interact with opioids in our system. And something to keep in mind here is that intimate partner violence does have physical health effects, including increased risk for HIV. And then the quality of the substance. So when we remember that a high, you know, the overdose epidemic is really being driven by the presence of synthetic opioids, including fentanyl, in the drug supply not necessarily because of increased rates of opioid use. And so the way that this can uniquely impact survivors is that a common tactic of substance use coercion is to lie to survivors about what they're using um, how, and how much they're using. And so what we've heard time and time again from survivors, from advocates, from harm reduction, uh, um, organizations and, and harm reductionists, time and time again, what we've heard is that survivors were being lied about, lied to about what they were using and how much they were using. And then when they were able to escape that unsafe relationship and went to use what they thought was their kind of regular amount and the substance they were using, they then experienced an overdose because in fact, that was not what they had been injected with and that was not what they were using. Then people experiencing incarceration, overdose has been found to be a leading cause of death. And here, remembering that survivors of intimate partner violence are at increased risk for incarceration. And this applies um, to people of all genders and ages, but particularly women and girls who experience domestic violence, intimate partner violence, or sexual violence are at increased risk for incarceration. And women and girls are the fastest growing population in carceral settings. So what about domestic and sexual violence itself? So not as something that is just increasing risk, these other overdose risks, but just the fact that people are experiencing domestic or sexual violence. So there's a huge gap in the research literature here, but there is some preliminary uh, data that I can share with you. This is a preliminary finding from a study that's being led by Dr. Louisa Gilbert uh, from Columbia University. And something that she has been finding is that women who experienced domestic and sexual violence were more likely to have also experienced an overdose. And on top of that, 
94% of women who use drugs and identify needing domestic violence services found that they couldn't access domestic violence services. So there's a lot that we can do to change this reality. There's a lot that we can do to collaborate across our fields to help ensure access to desired and needed resources. Um, and to understand that domestic and sexual violence in and of itself can increase overdose risks. Now here, this is, um, this is a small qualitative study, but the, um, the results are really eye-opening. And so here, wanted to share this. This is recent, it's just published in 2021. And this was looking at what are some of the priorities that people have when it comes to overdose among people who are using fentanyl. And they found some gender differences. So something I'll highlight here is that what, what they found was that women feared physical and sexual violence and prioritized parenting as well as relationship with uh, child services over overdose concerns. So that's really eye-opening. We think about how incredibly prevalent uh, the experience of physical and sexual violence is for women, especially women who are using substances who then are experiencing that increased targeting for victimization and how for some women, it may actually be that safety, that parenting and that parent-child attachment is actually prioritized over overdose safety. That's really important for us to keep in mind as we're supporting folks with overdose prevention planning. And then for men, the, um, it was found that men feared incarceration related to acquiring substances and using substances and feared uh, contracting HIV. And so understanding that all of our overdose uh, prevention needs to be really person-centered and really holistic and understand the intersections and the connections between overdose risk and what people are prioritizing and really stay in that person-centered place. Now, some other overdose risk factors have to do with um, our pattern of use or some individual factors. So here, using alone, because overdose, we can't reverse our own overdose. And so using alone means that there's nobody there to get help. There's nobody there to reverse the potential overdose. Now, something to keep in mind with survivors is that many survivors ex have experienced physical and sexual victimization when they use. And so using alone may be a way that someone is trying to stay safe or using alone may be a preference that is based out of a trauma response, a trauma experience. And so you know, again, thinking about using alone as a risk factor, and we need to be aware of that. And we certainly want to share information about that. We want to, we don't want to withhold information. We want to support informed decision making. But that if someone is saying to us that, you know, there's no, there's no one safe that they could use with, and that they um, have to use alone, that's the only way that they can be safe, to really, really believe them, to really understand that, and to um, look for other avenues for maintaining safety. Um, so that person-centered piece is really key. And a resource that we'll be talking about in a little bit for folks who don't have access to safe social supports when they're using is a resource called Never Use Alone. Um, and it's on the fact sheet and we'll be talking about it in a little bit. A history of prior overdoses. So here I think about once the body has kind of um, learned how to overdose or experience that overdose, then it becomes kind of that overdose threshold um, becomes easier to cross. An erratic pattern of use, that can look a lot of different ways. That can mean getting our substances from different sources, using at different times of the day, using in different places, um, using different amounts, you know. So anything that makes that pattern of use not kind of um, 
predictable and stable, right? Can increase overdose risk because ultimately that also can impact our tolerance shifting. Mixing any substances, but especially mixing downers. So mixing opioids with anti-anxiety medications like Xanax, Ativan, Valium, et cetera, or um, mixing opioids with alcohol because all of these are gonna suppress our breathing and they're gonna strengthen each other's effect. So they're gonna make this, the effect of the substance stronger in our body. Physical health conditions. Um, I often think about this as our body, our systems are already experiencing some stress from physical health conditions and then the overdose gets layered on top of that. Not testing the dose. Now, testing the dose can mean a couple different things. Um, historically, what it's meant is using a very small amount of a substance in order to check the strength of that substance, as well as check our tolerance, where our tolerance is at in that moment. And then from there, um, deciding how much to use, as opposed to just kind of using kind of a regular dose of, what, of how much we we usually use. Now with, um, in recent years, this can also come to mean testing our substances for the presence of fentanyl. And um, there is research that has found that people will take that information, they'll know, if they know that there's fentanyl in the substance that they're using, then they'll enact some different safety strategies to avoid fatal overdose. Now, a pattern of impulsivity or a history of suicidality, self-injury, depression, or depressed mood are all associated with um, a more kind of erratic pattern of use and a reduced likelihood of using some different safety strategies. A recent period of abstinence, me meaning a recent period of not using substances and not using opioids particularly. Now that's because tolerance shifts. Something to keep in mind here is that that abstinence may not have been chosen by the person. So that may have been abstinence because they're leaving, let's say, a jail setting or they're leaving hospitalization or maybe they were... Um, in a shelter where they couldn't use for a couple of days, but now they're not in that shelter anymore. So that, that period of abstinence or of non-use, it may be voluntary, it may be involuntary, but either way, it's gonna impact tolerance and it's gonna increase overdose risk. Not having an overdose prevention plan. And so an overdose prevention plan creates opportunity for people to really um, reflect, make informed decisions, and make some safety plans around both preventing overdose as well as responding to potential overdose in hopes of reversing it. You know, we see the same thing with safety planning in intimate partner violence. That safety planning does, does help mitigate some of those risks, does help increase safety. The same is true here for overdose prevention planning. And that is a direct way that we can support people in addressing some of their risks. And then finally here, when somebody uses and they're seeking profound intoxication. When someone is seeking profound intoxication, they're much more likely to use a regular dose, um, whatever their regular dose is. And they're much less likely to use a very small amount to kind of test where their tolerance is at. So someone seeking profound intoxication is just in essence going to end up using more versus somebody who's using just a tiny bit to deal with withdrawal, for example. So let's take a moment and practice share, practice identifying some overdose risk factors using this scenario. So I'll read it out loud and I'll ask folks to enter in the chat what risk factors you notice. Kelly recently called seeking resources after experiencing physical violence from her current partner. She shares that she uses opioid pills and alcohol daily. She's prescribed a benzodiazepine for anxiety that she usually takes once or twice a week. 
She finds that she's taking them daily recently because of heightened anxiety. And she has a history of suicide attempts and depression. So take a moment and see what, what overdose risk factors you notice. And I'll take a look at the chat here. All right. So here I've put in bold. Yes, absolutely. The using of multiple substances, especially the benzodiazepines, the opioids, and the alcohol. So the all essential nervous system depressants, all the downers, right? Also the history of suicide um, attempts and depression. Yes. The use is not regular, right? There's some changes, there's some erratic pattern of use. The, um, and then here, I'll also point out the physical violence, the fact that she's just experienced some physical violence. Some other things that we don't know yet in this snapshot of this scenario that we would also wanna be considering are, what's her housing situation? Is her housing safe and stable? Understanding that unsafe and unstable housing is a risk factor. Does she have any health conditions? And if so, does she have access to the health care that she desires? Remembering that physical health conditions are a risk factor and that survivors are at increased risk of experiencing different physical health conditions. Also, it'd be good to know who does she spend her time with? Is she using alone? or potentially using with people who are unsafe or may use her substance use to further victimize her. So both using alone is a risk factor, but then also the substance use coercion is a risk factor. What's her emotional support system look like? Would she be interested in some supportive counseling, thinking about her, her history of suicide attempts and depression? And Something that is important always, always to ask folks as we're talking with them is, what is she already doing to stay as safe as possible and prevent overdose? Does she have an overdose prevention plan? Does she have a naloxone kit? Does she have multiple naloxone kits? So also remembering the risk factor around if she doesn't have an overdose prevention plan or doesn't have access to naloxone. So recognizing and responding to potential overdose. So nearly 40% of overdose deaths occur while a bystander is present. So recognizing and responding and having the lock zone, just those simple things can do so much to save so many lives. So the main signs of overdose is that someone's gonna be non-responsive. They're gonna be unconscious, they're not gonna wake up, or maybe they're able to open their eyes slightly but not speak. Or if they're able to speak, it's, it's very, um, like they're only able to say maybe like one word or one word repeatedly, um, but they're not able to actually engage in, in, in sentences. You may also notice that they're having difficulty breathing. You may notice a gurgling sound or something that may get confused as, a, as like a deep snoring sound. They may have cold or clammy skin. And um, you may notice some discoloration because of the lack of oxygen. So you may notice some gray, purple, or blue lips or around the lips or nails. Sometimes people ask, well, how can I tell if someone's just really intoxicated versus they're experiencing an overdose? And the main thing is that someone who is profoundly intoxicated is still gonna be responsive. When you, when you, you know, lightly shake them, when you call their name, when you do a sternal rub, which we'll we'll practice that in a moment, there's they can be they can be roused. They um, they're still going to respond. They might 
their speech might be slurred, but they're still going to be able to, to respond to a question. Um, and you're also going to notice that they're breathing, right? So what do we do? We can use the save me method to respond. So we can stimulate folks, that light shake, the calling of their name, also the sternal rub. So go ahead and make a fist. And then with those knuckles, put that right over your breastbone and firmly just grind back and forth. Not so much that you hurt yourself, but enough to feel it. And as you notice, that's a tender spot right there. That'll wake somebody up if they're rousable. You can also do it right underneath somebody's nose. So right in their upper lip, you can just put that knuckle right there and firmly just kind of grind in a little bit. If they're still not responsive, we want to go ahead, check their airway, and give some rescue breaths. From there, that may be enough to respond to the overdose. Somebody may at that point, um, you know, uh, have the oxygen they need and be responsive. Um, if not, then go ahead and go to administering naloxone. Naloxone comes in three different forms. One is an intramuscular injection. Sometimes when people hear the word injection, they think, I'm not a medical provider, I can't give injections. What I'll say is that the naloxone injection is incredibly easy to learn how to give and to administer because it is intramuscular. It goes in a muscle. You're not trying to find a vein. You're not trying to get it into anywhere specific other than a major muscle group, which is gonna be shoulders, thighs, buttocks, right? So basically, whichever major muscle group is the easiest for you to access on that person. You can go through clothing. You don't have to get down to the skin. You don't have to prep the skin, none of that. So we can, in an overdose epidemic, we can overcome any fear we may have around injection and do what we need to do to save a life. There's also an auto injector. This is, um, you know, this is something that talks you through administering the naloxone um, and is very similar to other auto injectors like the AVQ or the EpiPen. Then there's also a nasal spray. And the nasal spray is so incredibly easy to give that the times that I have administered a nasal spray to somebody and thankfully been able to save their life, when I have pressed the nasal spray, I have questioned whether or not I did it. It was like, did it happen? Did I do it? Did the naloxone come out? And then when they have revived is when I've known. So um, many times organizations will choose to keep the nasal spray. And if you are in a nonprofit, you can also access the nasal spray at a government price, which um, means at a reduced price, about half the cost versus if you were just buying it over the counter. Now, um, many, many states, if not all states at this point, I think, have a standing order for naloxone, which means that a prescription is not necessary for naloxone. And naloxone is increasingly available through local harm reduction organizations, local public health agencies, pharmacies, and other resources. And the fact sheet has some resources on how to access naloxone. Um, many times you're able to partner with public health agencies or, or harm reduction organizations and become an naloxone distribution site. Now, after you administer naloxone, you want to evaluate again, see if the person becomes responsive, wait a few minutes, and then if they still haven't become responsive, then um, you go ahead and administer more naloxone. And all the while you're evaluating, you're also stopping to give some rescue breaths as well. If you need to leave the person at any moment um, in order to maybe like open a door for first responders or you know get a phone to call for help, things, for, things like that, you want to leave somebody in the recovery position. Now here is the recovery position. You'll notice that one leg is over the other leg and so that, that's to stabilize the person so that they're not just lying flat on their belly. And then you'll also notice that one arm comes up and the other arm comes over, folds to kind of cradle their head. And this 
is again, so they're not just lying flat on their face and that if they were to vomit at any point, that they're in a re safe recovery position where they aren't going to aspirate that vomit. They aren't gonna choke on it. Now, we wanna continue to support somebody um, while first responders arrive or for at least the first couple of hours after an overdose. Recognizing that naloxone can wear off um, and the person may start overdosing again, depending on what was in their system, how much it was, and their ability to, to clear it from their system. And we certainly want to comfort folks. And if people, people may want to use more if they're experiencing withdrawal when they revived. Um, and so we want to comfort them and prevent them from using more. Now, medical attention is recommended. Um, there can still be risk if the naloxone wears off, there could be other substances in their system, and naloxone only works for opioids. There, and there are overdose immunity laws in many jurisdictions. Now, what this means, overdose immunity laws are laws that try to encourage people to access medical care in the case of an opioid overdose. Um, and they do so by trying to, trying to eliminate some of the legal repercussions that people are subject to because of the criminalization of substance use. Now, something that, so we want to be aware of what are the overdose immunity laws in our jurisdiction, and then to provide information on it and support people's informed decision making. They, these laws are really different from area to area. In some areas, they'll protect people from prosecution related to uh, opioid use or opioid possession, but won't protect people from prosecution uh, related to, let's say, cocaine use, right? That's a huge problem. That's a huge problem when we consider the rising overdose rates um, related to stimulants like cocaine and methamphetamine and the presence of fentanyl in cocaine and methamphetamine. So that's, that's a huge gap in this protection. In some jurisdictions, people may be protected from prosecution for opioid use, but it doesn't protect them from arrest. So that's another big gap that needs to be addressed. Um, in some jurisdictions, people will be protected from arrest and from prosecution, but they won't be protected from a mandated report to child protective systems. So again, it's important to know what are, what, what is the overdose immunity law in your area, and then to provide accurate information on it and help people to realistically safety plan. Now, overdose in stimulants, there is a rising presence of opioids in stimulants. Um, we see, and we see stimulant overdoses increasing, both because of the presence of opioids and stimulants, but also just related to stimulants in of themselves. And people, people may use them together on purpose, and people may not know. On the other hand, people may not know that there's opioids in their stimulants. And so this is where fentanyl testing can be really helpful. And I saw in the chat that someone is uh, distributing fentanyl testing strips. That is great. Testing strips are incredibly affordable for programs to source and we can help people learn how to use them and then support them in using these in part of their overdose prevention uh, planning. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, research has found that people do um, take this information and then use strategies to help prevent overdose when they do have this information. Now that said, fentanyl testing isn't enough because in some areas, the whole drug supply has been poisoned with fentanyl. And so if every time that you're testing your substances, they're coming up positive for fentanyl, it becomes really hard to know um, to adequately safety plan around that. It also is really important because there are some substances that 
aren't just fentanyl that are coming into the drug supply and are equally dangerous. And so there is a, a growing, growing availability of something called full drug checking services, where they don't just test whether there's fentanyl in the substance, but they're actually able to test for all the different substances that are in that substance. And that is an incredibly important resource for folks. Now with overdose related to stimulants, sometimes also called over amping, um, these are some of the severe signs and health issues that we'll notice. Um, so we may notice things like difficulty breathing, high blood pressure, high body temperature, chest pains, seizures, stroke, heart arrhythmia, hallucinations, or very extreme agitation and anxiety. With things like extreme agitation and anxiety, there are certainly things that people can do to just um, be able to soothe and comfort. But with some of these other things, this really does require uh, emergency medical attention because there is no single medication to reverse a stimulant overdose. And that emergency medical care will focus on treating or preventing heart attack, stroke, and organ shutdown. Now, health promotion goes a long way for preventing uh, overdose related to stimulant. So here, there's a lot of just overall health promotion that will be helpful for overdose prevention. Things like HIV and hepatitis C prevention and treatment, sexual health care, safer sex materials, and sexual harm reduction support. Some things to keep in mind here is that sexual violence is a very common aspect of intimate partner violence and substance use coercion and that that can also include reproductive coercion. So um, forcing people to become pregnant when they are trying to prevent pregnancy. And so here, it's really important to have awareness of intimate partner violence so that we can support people in realistically strategizing and safety planning. So for example, um, you know, myself having worked in the HIV field for over a decade, we often talked about condom negotiation, but how does condom negotiation look and feel in the context of a relationship where somebody doesn't have as much power as the other partner? So being really DV aware and aware of intimate partner violence and supportive. Supporting nutrition and hydration, especially before using and while coming down from use, routine health care and access to behavioral health care. And then of course, we wanna have follow-up. If we've responded to an overdose or a member of our team has responded to overdose, um, we want to follow up. We wanna follow up and support the person who experienced the overdose, help neutralize any shame and support overdose prevention planning. A lot of times people can experience a lot of stigma um, when they have experienced an overdose, even from people who are trusted supports. So we want to be sure to reach out and be that, be that support. We want to provide emotional support for anyone who was involved in responding to the overdose. And then follow up. Create a space for staff to check in, to access support. And then we, we also want to cultivate space to honor the lives that we have lost to overdose. It's far too many. So now actually, you know, moving into how do we share this information? How do we offer and support folks? Remembering that three in five people who died from overdose had an identified opportunity for linkage to care or life-saving actions. So this is something that needs to be really routine in everything that we do. So in order for overdose prevention to be effective, the person has to be able to access naloxone on an ongoing basis, and they need to be able to share this information with the people who may be around um, when they may experience an overdose. And so I often shift from talking about some of the 
you know, overdose risk factors and talking about, um, you know, safety, you know, safety planning with people around overdose, I'll often shift into talking about this by saying something like, you know, you now are ready to save somebody else's life. Would it be all right if we took a moment and talked about what you could do so that this information could potentially save your life? Because the life you save will not be your own, right? Overdose cannot be reversed by the person experiencing it. So who can provide overdose prevention support? Any one of us. With the proper training and support, any one of us can be prepared to offer overdose prevention and share and distribute naloxone. You do not need to have a medical background. And a lot of research has found that overdose prevention and response provided by peers, meaning people who use drugs, and lay people, meaning non-medical people, is an incredibly important tool in preventing fatal overdoses. So what do we do? The relationship is primary. We build trustworthy relationships. Relationships that keep the door open for discussing substances, no matter where somebody may be at in, discuss it, in their own process and relationship with substances. Remembering that sometimes when people are uh, not using substances, maybe the times that they're actually at increased risk for overdose. I have lost folks who were not using substances and then returned to substance use without tolerance and, um, and could not have their overdose reversed. And so remembering that this information applies to everybody, um, that we're in an overdose epidemic, we all need this information. We want to provide non-judgmental and non-coercive education around overdose risk and overdose prevention. And so one way to do that is using the elicit, provide, elicit model. So this comes from motivational interviewing. The first elicit is getting a sense of what somebody already knows about overdose or naloxone, getting a sense of what somebody may already be doing to stay as safe as possible, right? From there, we move into provide. And so with permission, we ask for permission. With permission, we then share some information that may be helpful. Now, start based on that first elicit, we have an idea of what the person's already doing. We can build on what they're already doing with the information we provide. We can potentially fill in some gaps in information. Or if there are some misconceptions at play, we can also help clarify some of those misconceptions. From after we provide that information, we then move back into that elicit. And here, this is what makes it truly conversational rather than a one-way kind of lecture. Um, so in the final elicit, we may ask about their reaction, right? What do you think about that? Or how does that fit in with your experience? We may ask them what else would be helpful to know or what other questions they may have. Or we may ask them what they think about next steps, right? How does this inform you? What do you think you'll do next? How would you like to move forward? So key steps in overdose safety planning is to create, help people to create an overdose prevention plan, help people to access naloxone on an ongoing basis, help people to recognize risk factors and strategize around how to mitigate those factors. Again, remembering that these need to be realistic and actionable for a person. So we can't name what is realistic for a person. We need to be really person-centered. Help people to know that tolerance changes with how much we use, the amount we use, if we're getting substances from different, um, from different sources. Also knowing that, for example, somebody may get uh, something that looks like a prescription pill um, on the street, so not from a pharmacy. And they may believe that that is a prescription pill, but it's, but it's actually not. It's actually just been pressed to look like a prescription pill. 
And unfortunately, there have been many lives lost of people, you know, thinking, okay, this is a safe supply. This is a pill that I've used before and I know how it's going to affect me. And then it, it actually has fentanyl in it or it has something else in it. And, um, and the person overdoses. To start low and go slow. This, so this means to start with a small amount and to go slowly to see how it affects them, to see how strong the substance is, to see where their tolerance is at. And someone, you know, someone may say, I'm not going to do that, right? That's not how I use. I'm not going to do that. And like, kudos to you for building a relationship where the person feels like they can say that to you. That's important. It's important for us to hear that and to honor that. And so, you know, but there may be times where a person may say, you know what, I'm not going to do that, but I'll consider it if, um, you know, if I haven't been able to use that day, right? Or if something has changed or is inconsistent, then they may consider it, right? When possible, avoiding mixing substances, especially those downers, avoiding using alone and keeping an alongside kit nearby. And with that integrated safety planning, always remaining survivor focused, survivor led, survivor defined. And then integrating awareness of intimate partner violence into that overall overdose prevention planning, knowing that sometimes what may increase safety related to substance use may increase danger related to domestic or sexual violence or vice versa. And then building in a follow-up plan, building in times to check in again in the future. Here's that resource I mentioned earlier. It's called Never Use Alone. It's available in English and in Spanish. You know, this is a group of volunteers who are who are filling a gap, who are coming together um, to try to save lives. And they are saving lives. Um, but because it is not fully funded and it's a group of volunteers, um, it's not 24 seven yet. Um, so, but this is a really important resource of folks who will safety plan with people as they use and will stay on the phone with them and then enact that safety plan if the person does begin to use an overdose or does begin to experience an overdose. So this is a resource that may be very important for somebody who, who is using alone for any reason and may be especially important for survivors of intimate partner violence. So here's just a summary of kind of what we can do next, um, but I'm actually gonna skip forward so that we can get to some questions. So I'm gonna skip through these next few slides um, with just some different resources, and then we'll get ready to take our questions. The last thing I'll say here is that August 31st is o International Overdose Awareness Day. This is a great reason to plan all kinds of community level events to raise awareness. And that whole week has actually been determined overdose awareness uh, week in the US uh, just recently, uh, last year by President Biden. And, um, and that said, it's October. Don't wait all the way till August to plan some overdose awareness events. This, we can always be sharing this information. So I'll just skip through these and we'll take our first question. Great. Um, our first question is, do you agree that legalizing substances would be beneficial? And there's um, so regulated sales, regulated dose, empty prisons, state taxation income, income for programs? Thanks for that question. Um, so I don't know, there's a lot that comes with legalization um, that because substances often then become commercialized once they're legalized, there's a lot of harms that can come uh, to public health with legalization. And so I wanna take a moment and say that I'm going to respond as uh, Gabriella and as a subject matter expert, not as a representative of uh, any 
government funded kind of event or as a representative of my organization. Um, so what I'll say here is that legalization often brings with it um, a new kind of range of public health harms because with it comes uh, commercialization. And commercialization is built on selling about 80% of a product to 20% of people who use that product. Um, and so it ends up um, really targeting people who may experience um, you know, substance use that is posing a risk to their health or, or you know, to their well-being really targets them to sell to them. And then we, we see with commercialization that then it's really looking at driving um, the purchase of that product. Right, and that's that's a function of uh, capitalism, of course, as part of the basic economic structure that we exist within. So, get yeah, what I personally believe, and also what our center can stand behind, is decriminalization. That the criminalization of substance use creates all kinds of harms for people. That really uh, punitive systems should have no role to play in something that is a health condition potentially and something that is a trauma response potentially, um, that there, there's no role for a punitive system in that. And that the criminalization of substance use is something that is constantly used to harm survivors of intimate partner violence and to harm their children as well. Um, and that criminalization, of course, impacts people of color at highly disproportionate rates and is not rooted in any kind of racial equity, that we need to end criminalization of substance use in order to be able to support racial equity. Um, with decriminalization, there can also be avenues for safe supply, remembering that we are amidst a drug poisoning epidemic. And we have seen safe supply uh, pilots in some other countries. Um, and we have seen them be very successful in some other countries without needing to necessarily legalize the substance. Thank you. Um, we do have one more question and it asks, does naloxone have expiration dates? Ah, great question. So naloxone has a printed expiration date. Um, everything basically does at this point, right? Now that said, as long as naloxone is, um, you know, it's a clear liquid, as long as it continues to be clear and it um, hasn't become cloudy, you know, if it hasn't been exposed to storage that isn't a good storage environment for it. So for example, naloxone shouldn't be stored in extreme heat. Um, so we shouldn't keep it in like the, you know, the car glove compartment in a hundred degree weather, right? So um, as long as it's been for the most part properly stored, there have been studies that have shown that naloxone continues to be effective and non-toxic, non-harmful, and continues to reverse overdoses for many years after its expiration date. So what many times people have done is, um, of course, we wanna get naloxone out in the community, right? We don't wanna just be sitting on stores of naloxone and letting them expire and not getting them into people's hands. We wanna be getting it out into the community. That said, if somebody is overdosing, Use the naloxone you have. If the, use the freshest naloxone you have. If you have naloxone that hasn't expired, use it. If, you, if the only naloxone you have is naloxone that is expired, use it, right? Um, as long as it's clear, not cloudy, um, it will likely still work. And there has been research that has found that it's still effective for many years past. I think I, it was up to five years they tested past the expiration date. Thank you. That is all the questions we have in our Q&A section, unless anyone would like to pop one in.
I am not seeing any. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining today. And thank you most importantly for everything that you do every day in supporting community members. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Gabriella, so much. And thank you for everyone for being here. Um, I, I put into the chat that we have one more uh, training in our Intimate Partner Violence Series. Um, so I put that the link to that registration into the chat. Um, just a reminder, your certificates of attendance can take up to two weeks to be processed and they will um, arrive via email. Uh, please keep an eye on your junk and spam, like I said. Um, they sometimes land there. And you will also be redirected as we close out this training to a very short survey. Um, it is how we are able to continue providing free trainings to you all. So we really appreciate you taking just a moment to fill it out. And again, you will be redirected to that automatically. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Gabriella. Have a good day.